All right, let's, let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> and let's read Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 11. Go down to verse 11. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief, again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Jesus being a New Testament form of Joshua. Verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, before we charge ahead in chapter 4, I want to go back to chapter 3 and verse 11. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. There are actually four separate rests mentioned in the book of Hebrews. And a majority of, of modern-day scholars, as it were, they make an allegory of all the Old Testament references and apply them to New Testament salvation. This is a mistake. Even some great men, some wonderful preachers in church history uh, stumbled over this idea. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, and Francis Ashbery. Francis Ashbery, who followed Wesley as a Methodist circuit rider, he actually rode well over 2,000 miles on horseback, horseback, preaching from town to town in England. And here in the United States, there was a great Methodist revivalist named Peter Cartwright uh, in the late 1700s and mid 1800s, who was also a circuit riding preacher, or at least a horse and buggy preacher from town to town. Um, Peter Cartwright was also an American politician. He lost a primary in 1846 for the U.S. Congress to another uh, politician named Abraham Lincoln. And um, he was a great Methodist preacher. But all of these men assumed, rightly assumed, that if the rest mentioned in verses 11 and 18 back in chapter 3, was aimed at a born-again child of God, then he can possibly lapse into unbelief and thus lose uh, his entrance into heaven. If he's believed the gospel, as it's mentioned in verse, chapter 4, verse 2, then he's going to have to labor to enter into that rest, down in verse 11. So, but, but the four rests can be carefully divided this way. First of all, there is the rest which was given every week on the Sabbath day, mentioned in chapter 4, verse 4. Secondly, there is the rest of the, of the Jews entering into the promised land, land of Canaan, uh, mentioned back in chapter, referred to back in chapters 3, chapter 3, verses 11 and 18. Thirdly, there's the rest of the Jew who survives the tribulation one day and is able to enter into the millennium in Christ's kingdom. And that's referred to in chapter 4, verse 11. And lastly, 
there is the rest from your good works as you trust Jesus Christ to be your Savior. That's mentioned in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. But uh, unless someone rightly divides the word of truth, and it simply means reading each verse, comparing each verse, comparing each context in the larger uh, setting of the entire Bible, and seeing how verses are similar and how they're different, which contexts match and which contexts don't match. If you're saved by grace through faith plus nothing, then you can't come along and find another verse that says you have to do something in order to keep to be saved. Or you have to do something in order to stay saved. If God did the saving, then you don't do the saving. But if God didn't do all the saving, then perhaps there is something left for you to do. But what is it? Narrow it down. Be specific. Be precise. Tell me exactly what it is I have to do to make sure my salvation is complete. And nobody can seem to, seems to be able to do that. The Methodists, the Nazarenes, the Wesleyans, the um, Lutherans, the Mennonites, the Church of Christ, uh, the Greek Orthodox, other churches, uh, can never tell you exactly what it is you have to do to make sure that your salvation is now secure. Uh, and as I said before, the opposite of eternal security is eternal insecurity. Maybe there's something I have to do, or maybe there's something I did to undo my salvation, and I have to get it back again. I have a friend who uh, we used to work together for Jack Chick. And uh, one of the ladies that worked with us was from the Pentecostal background, and she asked my friend, do you believe, uh, are you one of those Baptists who believe once saved, always saved? And he said, oh no, I, I believe once born, always born. <laughs> the Bible says being born again not of corruptible seed, but being born again of incorruptible by the word of God, Amen. which liveth and abideth forever. And um, he and I had a good laugh about that one after he told me the conversation. But uh, in this section here, the original Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath was given, uh, was, a, was set by, as an example, by God himself. Let me turn to a few scripture verses. I was looking at, I typed in BBC International, go back to the real Genesis chapter 2, BBC International on the internet, not on, the, on YouTube, just on Google, search engine. And uh, up pop uh, some of our sermon videos, Pastor Gene Haw's videos, and uh, there was a guy who had posted a couple of videos calling Pastor Gene Kim a heretic and uh, trying to expose his false teachings for this reason, that reason. And one of the videos, the guy was clearly a, a, a befuddled Seventh Day Adventist and was trying to say Gene, Dr. Gene Kim, is a false prophet because of what he teaches concerning the Seventh Day. Sabbath, and thought this guy's this guy's a, a Bible blockhead. The guy that posted the video, <laughs> he evidently can't read. You know, part of the problem with false doctrines is based on people who don't know how to read. Well, they can pronounce the words and sound out the phonics and so forth, but they don't know how to read. They they can't uh, pay attention to context. Who's speaking? About what are they speaking? To whom are they speaking? What are they saying to that person? Or what didn't they say to someone else? And so he posted a video that Gene Kim is a, a heretic or false prophet. No, he called him a false prophet. That's what he called him. And so I watched about 10 seconds of the guy's video and I, I clicked it off. I, I couldn't take any more. I thought about posting a video just in Sunday school today uh, in defense of Gene Kim. But that. Uh, he doesn't need me to help him. He's, he's got plenty going on, and he's, he's able to stand on his own. But I'm, I'm just referencing that because look at Genesis chapter 2 and uh, verse 3. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created 
and made. The Seventh-day Adventist will say that the Sabbath began with God, Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. But God didn't command anybody in Genesis 2, verse 3, to keep the Sabbath. He hadn't made anybody yet. There was nobody there yet. He didn't even make Adam and Eve yet. So who, who did he command that to? The Bible says God rested, and the Seventh-day Adventist will say ever since the creation, the seventh day has been the day God wants men to rest and give him due attention and honor. But that's not what it says. It says that God rested from his creation. And you get to Genesis chapter 20, or actually 16 through 20, Mount Sinai, there God commands Moses for the first time about resting on the Sabbath day. And you know, and why that's important to bear in mind, if you ever get to talking to a Seventh-day Adventist, I had a friend I used to work with who was an Adventist, and uh, I said to him, you know, he's, he believed that the uh, worshiping on the seventh day, or the Sabbath day, will one day be the mark of the beast that's forced upon men by the Antichrist, because the Adventists maintained that the seventh day Sabbath was an invention, or rather not the but but worshiping on Sunday, excuse me, let me back up, worshiping on Sunday was invented by the Roman Catholic Church, and since the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope will be the man of sin, that worshiping on Sunday uh, is part of the mark of the beast. And that's why they insist on worshiping only on Saturday, or the seventh day, uh, and uh, that if you do so, to work on the, worship on the Sunday, then you've taken the mark of the beast. They, that's how they used to teach it. There's a big book called Bible Readings for the Home, and it was a bunch of uh, Bible studies based on different texts, from the Adventists, and some very good material in it, but intermixed with the good material is a little bit of a poison and heresy that made uh, them say that if you worship on Sunday, you've essentially taken the mark of the beast. You've um, acquiesced and given your loyalty to something the Pope had uh, created and invented. But um, I had a friend tell me that uh, he thought that worshiping on Sunday would one day be the mark of the beast, and because worshiping on Saturday was begun by God in Genesis chapter 2. And I said, you know, God never commanded anybody to worship on the seventh day until he got to Moses in Exodus chapter 16 to 20, Mount Sinai. Prior to that, nobody knew about worshiping on the seventh day or resting on the seventh day. Not Adam, not his sons, not Noah, or his three sons, not any of their descendants, not Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. Nobody had any idea that God wanted them to rest and give him their attention on the seventh day of the week until God began to command it specifically to Moses and the nation of Israel. But the Seventh-day Adventist can't read. He thinks that uh, the Seventh-day command for men to worship began in Genesis 2 when God rested himself. But you'll search in vain to find any commandment given by God to anybody to rest on the seventh day until Moses comes along. Do you know how much time elapsed between Genesis 2 and Exodus 20? About 1,800 years. That's how much time elapsed between those two texts. So you have to ask the Adventist, um, how is it that if it was so important, God let 18 centuries go by without telling anyone about it? to point out the, the, the fact that they're not able to read plain English. They're not paying attention to what's being said, to whom it is being said, and about what uh, is the subject. But Genesis, um, let's continue. It was revealed to Moses at Mount Sinai, go forward, go all the way forward to Mount, or to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah and chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments, and true laws, good statutes, and commandments and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath, 
and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, thy servant. It wasn't revealed to anybody until Mount Sinai and Moses. And it was given to Israel as a sign, not to all nations. Go to Exodus, or rather to Ezekiel, chapter 20. Go forward to Ezekiel, chapter 20. Notice there, verses 19 and 20. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And hallow my Sabbaths. And they shall be a sign between me and you. That ye may know that I am the Lord your God. He didn't say that to Gentiles. He didn't say that to the Philistines. He didn't say that to the Hittites or the Jebusites. He said that to the Jew. He didn't say that to Muslims. He didn't say that to Roman Catholics. He didn't say that to, to New Testament Protestants or Bible believers. He said that to the Jew. That was given to the Jew as a sign between them and their God. That this was to be separated uh, for their observance of God, their recognition of God, no matter what uh, the other nations around them were doing, no matter what days they observed, uh, signs in the heavens and followed astrological calendars and so forth, that was given to the Jew to stand as a sign of a covenant between God and them. And the Seventh-day Adventists will try to insist that it was given to all men everywhere. No, it was not. Write those texts down and, and turn to them and show it right to their face. That's all, you, that's all you can do, ultimately. All you can do is shove the scripture down their throat. Because they say, they, they want to maintain that they believe the Bible. Well, if you believe the Bible, then what do you do with these verses? Put those verses together the way we just did, and you'll see that God, command, God did not command anyone in Genesis 2. He didn't command anyone until they got to Mount Sinai. And it was a, as a commandment to the Jews, specifically. A covenant or promise signed between him and and them. Now, um, in our text in Hebrews chapter 4, the second Sabbath, um, on the list I, I made mention of, um, the, final, the final rest will be the Jew entering into the millennium. But that entering into the millennium was typified um, earlier when it came to the Jew entering into the land of Canaan. Go, if you will, to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. And uh, notice there verse 30. And Caleb still the people, well, first of all, they back up. Here in Numbers 13, they send in spies into the promised land to search out the land, to come back and describe it. And um, I think the book of uh, Joshua also mentions them going in to come back and describe the land. They were going, they were supposed to, the word describe, like the word scribe implies, is something written. It's a written account. We use it, it's been used now to mean whether you're, it's an oral account or a written account. But technically the word describe means to write something down. Just like schreib is the German word for write. Uh, scribe, script, scribble, scripture, so on. But to describe means to give a written account of something, and they sent spies into the land of Canaan to describe the land. That is, they sent them in to make maps of the promised land before Joshua and Caleb uh, led the people in later on. So they were drawing maps of the land that God was going to give them to inherit. But before they got to that, they would send in spies to search out the land, to scope it out, look at it, 
to examine it, to evaluate it, to see what was good and what was bad about it, to, to come back and give an account of what they saw and witnessed. And you recall them coming back with a big cluster of grapes from the vines. That's how lush the vegetation was and the fruit of the land. And uh, notice, but they came back and said, uh, we saw the Anakims, a people great and walled up to heaven. And we were as grasshoppers in their sight. That's how tall they were. And the very mention of the giants in that land caused the multitude to quake in fear. They said, there's no way we want to go in there now. They'll stomp on us. They'll, they'll destroy us. There's no way we can defeat them. But notice what we read in Numbers chapter 13. And uh, I guess it's verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. In chapter 14, verse 9. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. So, when he mentions the gospel, a connection of the connection to this, uh, in Hebrews chapter four, it was not the gospel of the grace of God by grace he saved through faith. It was not the Pauline gospel of the New Testament. He's alluding to the gospel preached uh, to the Jew before entering into the land of Canaan, and it was the gospel of armed warfare and armed victory. If you believe God, I've got good news for you. He'll destroy your enemies once you enter into the promised land. And you have two million people basically on field maneuvers for a length of time. After 40 years, they, had, they were, like I say, on, on uh, field maneuvers for 40 years on foot, without any permanent shelter, no permanent dwellings, having to tear down their tents, put the tents back up again, set up camp uh, in town after town and place after place. There wasn't an army in the world that, have could, that could have withstood the invasion of Israel once they reached Canaan. But before they had to wander 40 years, God said, I'll give you a chance to go in right now. But the people refused to believe. And that's why that... Um, story of them entering, not entering into God's rest in the land of Canaan is a great foreshadow of them finally entering in to the millennium under Jesus Christ. In fact, it's such a great type um, of um, actually go to the book of let's go to the book of Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah 12, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. I'm going to move along quickly here. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens, and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like a heart, like an hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in the sheaf. And they shall devour all the people round about, on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. That is the hope of the Jew today. They are a burdensome stone. They are a stumbling block for the rest of the world. And countless nations have sought to come against them. 
the United Nations are united in very few things except one thing, and that most of them hate Israel. Most of them hate the state of Israel. And God help the United States if we ever turn our back on defending the right of the state of Israel to exist. The Jew is smart enough and clever enough and able to take care of himself and defend himself. But because of political relations, um, they don't launch all-out destructive warfare against all their Muslim enemies. They certainly could. They could wipe them all out uh, within the next 72 hours. But because of their friendly negotiated relationship with the United States and other nations that currently support their right to exist, they have to um, invest in defense systems like the Iron Dome and other systems, detection systems, to give them a warning of incoming missiles that they can duck for cover before they land and uh, put up border security walls and fences and checkpoints to go in and out to make sure that there are no car bombs coming in or out and uh, checking citizens and, and people to make sure they're not strapping um, a backpack full of explosives onto themselves before they go to the pizza place. And because of all of those measures, Israel enjoys uh, safety, um, as it were, as it is, uh, like they've never known before. But it's not permanent. It's not stable. And uh, they are indeed a burdensome stone. All the Muslim nations hate them. The Roman Catholic Church hates them. You know, the Crusades, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, were intended to go and conquer the Muslims and retake the, the nation of the state of Israel, Palestine, and claim it for the Pope. It's hard to say that you are the religion that Christ founded if your headquarters are not in the city where Christ founded it. And so they sought to destroy, go to war against the Muslims who had inhabited uh, Israel for centuries, or the land of Palestine for centuries, and claim it in the name of the Popes. Uh, of course, all they ended up doing was giving Christianity a bad name. That's why Jews are shied away from Billy Graham's crusades, because of the name. They thought that all they associated that word with was violence against uh, Jewish people uh, or anyone that stood in the way of their conquering of the land. And, uh, but <clears throat> right now, and, and the Jew is going to enter into his promised land eventually. He did not in the time of Caleb and Joshua because of unbelief. They would not believe and trust God to defend them as they went in and take the land right away. So God says, all right, you'll wander for the next 40 years till every one of you that doesn't believe me and complains dies in the wilderness. And then they tried to regroup. Okay, well, we'll, we'll go in now. But God said, no, I'm not with you now. My hand of blessing isn't with you. The second time they thought they'd go in, and a lot of them uh, were destroyed and, and killed, trying to go in when God was no longer going to help them. So they want it for the next 40 years, but eventually they'll get their land. However, there's one qualifier that's necessary. They have to now believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior in order to be entitled to win you into that land. And here's the interesting thing. Hebrews 2 and verse 10, look back at it. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So the gospel of armed victory uh, requires a captain to lead them in. And uh, when the Lord Jesus comes back, he will be the captain of their, their salvation in finally getting the land, finally getting the kingdom, finally getting the promises God made to Abraham. See, Joshua is dead, so a new Joshua takes his place by the same name. And that's why the King James Bible uh, sheds advanced light, advanced revelation in Hebrews 4, uh, verse 8. For if Jesus, that's a New Testament reference to Joshua, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? So the King James Bible translates that word as Jesus rather than Joshua and sheds advanced light, 
advanced revelation that a new captain is going to come, and he will lead. He will be their military uh, leader, their military captain, when they vanquish the Antichrist and inherit the land and the promises that God gave to Abraham and to their ancestors. The King James Bible is right in translating it as Jesus instead of Joshua, like uh, many of the modern versions do. Uh, thirdly, there is the rest of the Jew entering into the kingdom after the tribulation. And that, of course, requires works, faith and works. Uh, faith because they've just come after the church age and works because they're Jews and they, were, they had commandments given them by Moses, through Moses. And uh, without dwelling on this one too lengthy, we've covered it many times before. In the tribulation, salvation will not be by grace through faith plus nothing. It'll be some combination of faith and works coupled together. Uh, Matthew 24, 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And Hebrews 12, or rather, Revelation 12, verse 17, and Revelation 14, verse 12, both say, uh, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the fourth rest referred to in the book of Hebrews is going to be found there in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. As, as God rested the seventh day, on the seventh day from all of his work, you, trusting in Jesus Christ, rest from your own good works Amen. and depend on him alone. Your salvation does not require you to join a church, to remember all the Ten Commandments and be sure to keep them all without fail, uh, be honest and truthful to everybody, to okay. give so much of your money to church, to do work so many hours at your job during the week, to donate so much to a charitable group, to give so much to the homeless. It does not depend upon you doing any number of good deeds and good works uh, to prove you're a good person. You know, you go to the Mormon church, and uh, I've been to them many times through my day job, and uh, their outside of their building says, the Church of Jesus Christ, in big bold letters of Latter-day Saints, and they want you to believe that they believe in that they believe in Jesus Christ and prove it by the fact that they have his name on the building. That proves we must be believers in Jesus Christ. It's sort of like the Church of Christ denomination. They say that the true Church of Jesus Christ has to bear his name. And therefore, because their sign says the Church of Christ, they claim they must be Christ's church. That's not only uh, simplistic, but it's simple-minded. Give me a break. You can have anything on there. It doesn't prove that anything uh, legitimate is taking place on the inside. You go to the Mormon funeral, for example. He was a good man. He was a good husband. He was a good dad. He was a good coach of our soccer team. He was a good boss to work for. He was a good auto mechanic. Uh, he was a good example to the people that he did business with. He was honest in his dealings. Uh, he worked hard around the church. He was a good volunteer for our different programs. He did this. He did that. He said this. He showed an example of that, and so forth. And when they get done praising the person and talking about how virtuous and noble and a great character they were, the person, the person giving the testimony says, and I bear this testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And they go sit down. That's the only mention Jesus Christ gets at a Mormon funeral. They worship the person. They worship themselves. They worship the works of other people and the hopeful works of themselves, of their own. And then they try to tag Jesus' name on the end of it and make you think that they believe in Jesus Christ. They do not. They believe in themselves. My dad says, uh, someone who's all wrapped up in themselves has the smallest package in the world. <laughs> but the last set of the last rest mentioned and we're going to come back to this next week but 
the last rest mentioned has to do with you resting from your own uh, efforts to try to save yourself, not by Amen. works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit that washes and regenerates and renews the sinner Amen. when he comes to Jesus Christ. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. So, there are four separate rests alluded to in these two chapters between Hebrews 3 and 4. And unless someone carefully uh, identifies all four and separates them, then it's, then it's confusing to think, well, if I've received Christ as my Savior, then I have to labor and work in order to make sure of it or to earn it, but not so. So we want to keep those things carefully separated and properly separated as we go.